You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, and today's guest is Ali Smink, the CEO of Sodak. Now, Ali has a very unique background. He was born in the Netherlands, raised in Tanzania, built and installed weather monitoring solutions in Sub-Saharan Africa, and now is a CEO of an IoT hardware company focused on low power sensing and tracking. So we're going to talk a lot about that low power sensing and tracking. We're going to talk about batteryless devices. We're going to talk about energy harvesting and just sustainability as a whole across IoT. But before we get to do that, if any of you out there are looking to enter the fast growing and profitable IoT market, but don't know where to start, check out our sponsor, Leverage. Leverage's IoT solutions development platform provides everything you need to create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Ollie, to the IoT for All show. Thanks for being here this week. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm uh, glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, I wanted to kick this off by having you talk a little bit more about your background experience a bit. From from everything that I read, it's a very unique background. You're born in the Netherlands, raised in Tanzania. You've done work in sub-Saharan Africa, and now you're the CEO of an IoT hardware company. Um, and I'd love to just kind of hear more about that background and that journey and kind of what brought you to Sodak. So my pleasure to uh, to give an intro. So um I uh, was born in the Netherlands, and uh, at uh, three years of age, I I was uh, I moved basically to Tanzania in East Africa with my family, with my parents and my younger sister, and uh, spent the majority of my childhood there, and uh, had an amazing upbringing, um, and got to experience two cultures, which really shaped me. Um, spent a lot of time, of course, in the Netherlands as well, and and around age sixteen, moved back to the Netherlands, um, and. Uh, my father is an engineer, uh, and and together we always worked on different projects. And uh, with that, also uh, started you know playing around with Arduino boards, uh, and and uh, and kind of got into to uh, developing hardware. Um, when uh, I was I was back here in in the Netherlands uh, in school, we decided to uh, look for projects that we could uh, make impact with in in East Africa. And uh, we stumbled upon an opportunity to help uh, some farmers with weather monitoring stations. Okay. And uh, we kind of combined the knowledge on Arduino and what we learned about low power embedded hardware with right. uh, with our impact drive. And uh, that got us started with, with IoT, actually. Fantastic. So how did you end up um, uh, with Sodak then? Was that a company that, I don't, I don't know if I have this information, but did you were you a founder of Sodak or was that, did you come into Sodak later on? So my father and I actually started the company together. Fantastic. Um, and so the whole project with, uh, with weather monitoring uh, branched off into its own company. So initially we started off, uh, we, we started off building some hardware for monitoring weather conditions, okay. rain, temperature, wind and such. And we had to build our own hardware to use solar power to, to get enough energy basically to measure these conditions and then to send it to the internet. And there was mobile connectivity available very readily available in, in, in most of sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we realized that with that type of hardware, that type of low power hardware, there was many other applications. So that's why we founded Sodak. Uh, we actually did a Kickstarter campaign for a development board that others could start making things. And at the same time, we, uh, we launched uh, another company uh, whereby we actually installed across six countries, these weather monitoring stations and helped a lot of farmers and research organizations. So, so where is, um... So coming from that story, which is fantastic, by the way, where is Sodak now? Like, what has transitioned from, or what has, I guess, grown from from then to now? What is the focus? How has it changed? Um, just kind of give us the full landscape there. So um, I think the the term Internet of Things really started coming up in the early days of Sodak, okay. um, around the same period. And um, what we were doing at the time was investigating what type of applications we could use these low power hardware technologies for and the energy harvesting from the sun um, we had our own web shop we were really you know interacting with a lot of cool uh, companies and individuals around the world really the early adopters of the internet of things and uh, over time we got requests from bigger and bigger companies to develop end solutions for them so to really design custom hardware and build software and 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 
uh, in an even later stage, uh, just a few years ago, we started adding industrial design, so making okay. enclosures and, and also adding basically the connection to the cloud more as well. Um, and we started adding more to our technology stack in that way as we got further. And uh, where we are now is that in the past eight years since we founded, we've done more than 200 different uh, development projects. Some of them you can see behind me uh, here. Um, and we've launched now in the last year four of our own products. Okay. Uh, so we've gone from basically providing developers with kits to making solutions for companies to now making mm -hmm. solutions for ourselves to bring to market. That's fantastic. I love that story. Uh, appreciate you walking us through that. That's great. I, I wanted to um, see if you could expand on a couple of the topics that you you talked about. You talked about energy energy harvesting. We talked about the low power elements to to all of this, which then also potentially lead into the discussion around like batteryless devices. Um, what have you seen since over the past eight years from an evolution standpoint when it comes to the developments in IoT, the developments in like sustainable IoT, what have you kind of seen happen over the course of the last eight years or so to where we are now? Uh, so on the communication side, uh, many new protocols have been brought into mm -hmm. the market. So uh, in the low power wide area networking space, we've moved from 2G networks, for example, which are not low power at all, to right. things like LTEM and narrowband IoT. Mm -hmm. um, we see that the telco organizations have put in a lot of work to make that possible. So have the module manufacturers. Uh, in the early days, we were making um, sort of components that we could plug onto our development boards for different communication protocols. Um, and we were working, for example, with SIMCOM modules. Um, okay. Over time, we saw that many other companies started entering the space. And now, for example, Nordic Semiconductor or Ublox or Quectel have really low power modules. So that's really right. changed. Um, on another, uh, in another protocol with LoRaWAN, we, we, we've seen a huge growth in network availability um, and also in the quality of the network. Um, so that's, that's more on, on, on the technology side and low power side. We've, we've gotten better and better at using these technologies, mm -hmm. creating better algorithms for using the device um, in an, uh, as little active mode as possible. So right. we have kind of this saying that we try to sleep as much as possible, working only when necessary, and then communicating as little as we can. Okay. Uh, so, so being in that sleeping mode basically right. allows us to consume next to no power. And that allows us to actually create products that can harvest energy from the sun or other mm -hmm. sources like motion or uh, radio frequencies. Right. Um, and, uh, that in turn then allows us to work towards having devices without batteries because batteries are highly polluting and uh, i i think it's nice to to, uh, to show you that we for example use these uh, wow. uh very completely flat uh, lithium yeah. ion supercapacitors okay um and and these are replacements for batteries that we're now implementing in products fantastic I wanted to kind of take a couple of those topics um, and dive into them a little bit. So on the low power side of things, when it comes to tracking and, and sensing technologies, what does, just for the general landscape and maybe those who are a little bit unfamiliar, or they've heard of you know, the low power elements to IoT, but not really, unsure, un, un, not really sure as to the value they provide or what they're kind of driven towards. Um, talk a little bit more about what low power um, solutions and tracking and the technologies behind them are enabling and what kind of use cases are low power solutions more ideal for? Very good question. Um, so we have seen that tracking has really been used, for example, in uh, vehicles that have continuous power available, um, okay. whereby low power is not really necessary. So trucks, for example, have been uh, tracked for many years already and where we uh, uh, see many opportunities and use cases for tracking and, and, and are working in many different uh, customer applications is in uh, the, net, the need to track um, assets or uh, whether they're moving or, or, or not, um, right. where there is no power source available. So uh, I can give you an example. Uh, you can see here on this side, there's a, a larger solar powered tracking unit yep. um, 
we use those specifically for truck truck trailers. So rather okay. than the truck itself, these swap bodies are exchanged between different uh, mm -hmm. trucks, and right. they want to know how many kilometers those drive. But there's no okay. source of power. So right. to uh, measure the location as often as possible um, with a small solar panel means you really need to use very little energy. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. So, so when would, I guess, when we're talking about just the full spectrum of different types of use cases that we've seen in IoT, so ones that are requiring more power are those use cases that are requiring to probably send data more often, send bigger kinds of data more often, things like that. And then on a low power side, we're seeing kind of the opposite. Is that relatively accurate? Correct. So okay. um, there's work being done on reducing the amount of overhead that needs to go into a payload that's in a message that is sent. Okay. So the less additional information on top of just, let's say, the GPS coordinates, right. uh, the more energy you use and waste. Right. Um, there's uh, protocols like power save mode or extended discontinuous receive mode, which okay. allow the network and the device to have an agreement on when right. the communication will happen. And therefore, uh, you don't need to have a handshake and, and uh, reconnect every time that you want to send a message. Gotcha. Um, so that, those are some ways in which we're saving a lot of, uh, a lot of power. Okay, fantastic. And then let's let's move into kind of where energy harvesting kind of plays into it from from that standpoint. Where does that really fit in in your mind? You know, I guess start off. I maybe just explain a little bit more what it is exactly for those of who may be uh, a little bit unfamiliar, and then the value and the benefits that energy harvesting uh, energy harvesting is bringing to the IoT space and potential use cases. So energy harvesting basically means that uh, the device that we're using. Yep. is fully powered by energy that it gathers from sources outside of the device without having be having to be recharged or connected to a fixed power source hmm. so the device itself can be fully autonomous so okay. uh, you have for example a solar panel on a device that gives uh, energy whenever there's sunlight to charge for example a super capacitor or a rechargeable battery um, which then has enough energy in it to continuously operate uh, okay. the device. So to measure its location, its temperature, and then to send that to the internet. And so we, for example, use an accelerometer inside the device that detects when there is motion. And from mm -hmm. that knowledge, we can assume that it's more important when the device is moving to start tracking it more often. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's not moving, then you can assume that it's in the same place. Gotcha. So, so then when we're thinking about the application of the technology and fitting it into potential use cases, how do you have that conversation with potential customers around when energy harvesting is a good fit for what they're building? Or I guess maybe the way to answer this would be to talk about what types of scenarios energy harvesting would not really fit in. Yeah, very clear. Um, what uh, traditionally was, was done was uh, a customer would calculate how many messages a device could send over its lifetime okay. and then okay. plan how long the device would last. So you would have a device with, for example, AA batteries in it that can send 10,000 messages, which may be spread over three years. Um, and then the device is done, would have to be opened, batteries replaced or completely removed. And okay. so whenever there's an opportunity to work with sunlight, um, then we uh, can have a conversation quite easily with our customer. So we, uh, anytime we open up discussions with any uh, interesting company to work with, we um, communicate from the beginning that uh, the sustainability and impact of our solutions is our primary concern. Okay. So our objective as a company is to use the Internet of Things to improve efficiencies in different business cases, mm. saving resources. Right. And and the objective should also be to then not create a new problem of electronic waste. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you drop that information, the customer is much more inclined to investigate the option for energy harvesting. Right. OK. And so that then ties into the conversation around devices without without batteries and how that kind of fits into the sustainability of IoT. The pollution element you mentioned earlier. Talk a little bit more about that. How do how do devices operate without batteries and you know where where does the technology today kind of stand in making that a more regular thing or a regular fit within use cases 
Um, when looking at uh, the need for a, a, a power storage or power availability, we need to look at um, what is the total amount of energy that our device needs, but also what are, for example, the peak energy usage moments. So we okay. look at peak currents and um, where you'll see that uh, instead of batteries, capacitors are really useful um, is in handling peak currents. However, traditional capacitors um, will not hold energy for or power for very long. So they have a very fast self discharge. And okay. so um, we have this term of batteryless devices as a sort of core element of what we do, um, okay. partly because we want to eliminate the use of batteries completely, but also because we want to challenge the notion around batteries. So what you'll see is that with uh, 3D printed completely flat batteries, we can make these kind of smart labels that are completely thin wow. but are cellular connected. Um, Interesting. Okay. You'll see here behind me a bit more of the inside. So you see the uh, uh, PCB here. Yeah. Uh, you see the antenna. You see the battery, which is completely uh -huh. flat. This is a cellular connected device, and okay. it's then used for, for example, par parcel tracking. We've got all sorts right. of gadgets here with me, and when the parcel is open, we actually detect. Um, oh, the parcel is okay. open because the seal breaks. Wow. Okay. Um, so in this case, we are using a battery, but we're using a battery that's fully recyclable. So what we okay. do is we have two components. We have the top and the bottom part. The bottom part sure. is recyclable with uh, materials um, like zinc, for example, uh, which are also used in medicines, for example. And, mm -hmm. the, and the top part is the electronics, which we can completely reuse. Um, oh, fantastic. Okay. So that's one example. And then the other is when we have, for example, a uh, tracker like this one, sure. the sun can power, uh, instead of a battery, a supercapacitor. Okay. Which has an, um, uh, an indefinite number of uh, charge cycles. So rather than like your smartphone, you have it for three years and then you really do have to replace it because the battery right. isn't functioning anymore. Right. Uh, that's because of the limit to the chemistry inside uh sure. and, okay. and, and charge cycles it can handle and these capacitors um can actually handle uh, you know thousands of times as many charge cycles therefore so, never having to be replaced inside of the device so when the when this when the capacitor is being in a sense charged by the sun um how long does that last you said a lot of them kind of quickly um, use up their charge, but is it something that it stores and kind of holds on to until it's needed to activate and uh, send data or you know be utilized by the device? Or how does that work? So we have uh, two types of capacitors. We have okay. standard uh, capacitors, which uh, don't hold charge very well, but are very fast at charging and discharging. Okay. Those are used on all sorts of electronics. You have really small capacitors that are used actually for power regulation on electronics. Sure. But these capacitors that I'm showing here actually have lithium ions inside. So it's a hybrid oh, yeah. capacitor. Gotcha. So it's, it's kind of in between a battery and a capacitor. So it and has the benefits of charging and discharging quickly. So you can charge your entire device in under two minutes rather than okay. a few hours. Sure. And it has uh, an almost indefinite number of charge cycles. That's awesome. That's really cool. Thanks for showing that. That's pretty neat. I like that. Um, I, I, I wanted to... Um, uh, transition just slightly to a different area of, of conversation before we wrap up. And it's it's really around in this area of kind of sustainable IoT that we've been talking about for a few minutes here. Where are you seeing the biggest challenges? And and maybe kind of tying that into more industry-wide challenges too that you've seen over the last couple of years or maybe even current, currently where we are now um, that are innate or I guess prohibiting certain adoption of technologies or some of these technologies scale more quickly than we'd like them to. Um, just what are you seeing from your standpoint regarding those challenges right now? Thank you for that question. Um, one of the uh, things that will be on everyone's mind is the current component shortage. Mm -hmm. um, we see that uh, because of some very weak links in our supply chain, we're reliant on certain paths that sure. uh, when there is, uh, uh, let's say, a deficiency of components, we're unable to get them, uh, right. which causes people to um, to, to over-purchase uh, high amounts of stock to reduce their risk. And that, okay. really, that really puts a strain on the whole market. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges also to sustainability, because 
what we want to work towards is uh, um, a model whereby we can innovate as quickly as possible. And okay. if we need to buy large quantities of stock to produce, uh, to have the safety, let's say, to be able to provide devices to our clients, then it's much more difficult to go through innovation cycles because we need to, uh, mu rather than uh, having different types of products and changing them over time, ra uh, instead of that, we're, we're having more of the same products. Okay. Um, so that's one big challenge. Uh, another one is uh, the cost of new innovations. So sure. the new modules that come out that have lower power functionality or mm. these capacitors that I'm showing you, they're produced in lower volumes than the, let's mm. say, traditional uh, less low power and less sustainable solutions. Sure. Um, also less widely adopted. Uh, something that I really like to, uh, um, and this is maybe something we can share in the um, in the communications around this mm -hmm. uh, uh, podcast is a, an article about flexible PCBs and okay. the sustainability uh, comparison of a rigid versus a flexible PCB, okay. um, and that there are significant savings to be had. But because the whole industry works around rigid PCBs, uh, the cost is lower, the time to market with a product is 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 quicker, uh, yeah. even though it's much less sustainable. And we're trying to uh, make customers aware of that so that they're willing to be more patient and potentially in the beginning pay more for solutions to um, bear that cost rather than that the environment needs to bear that cost. Gotcha. And how, um, how what have you seen kind of when you talk to customers? What are the challenges that they're coming to you with? How does that kind of fit into, you know, the, the overall view of the the market regarding the challenges that we're kind of facing We're, what are they kind of coming to you and kind of explaining that are big issues for them that they're seeing from their angle before they start working with you um one example that i really like is that we work with a company that's in the agricultural space and okay. uh, what they do is they provide materials to farmers um and and, and for example agrochemicals um and uh, they are required to um, ship these materials in uh, like large containers, uh, whether it's for liquids or for seeds. Um, and in that process, they um, don't have full control over the supply chain of where those containers are. And okay. that causes them to have to have a really large excess stock of these containers, mm. um, which means that there's a bunch of containers standing around which plastic was needed to create them and right. they come to us to to on the one hand look at how can we reduce the waste in that way uh, and use tracking to know where everything is and optimize that supply chain uh, mm -hmm. and, and on the other side um, we try to add innovative features so sure. what you'll see is that uh, uh, for example a, a container of liquid um, may be so cheap that it's not worth adding a tracker so let's say the container mm -hmm. costs 200 euros or dollars sense. to make right and the right. tracker uh costs maybe half or a bit less than half of that mm -hmm. then the business case is hard to to, uh, right. to prove itself um but by for example measuring the quantity of the liquid or the amount of liquid inside the container uh, by sure. using in our case radar um to measure the distance to the top of the liquid we can give additional information and then the uh customer or our customer can go to their customer whenever uh, they know that the liquid has almost completely been used up right. and provide marketing information and say, hey, isn't it time to buy new products yep. from us? Uh, and then it makes the business case worth it. So that then allows us to get more of that sort of circular model of getting mm -hmm. those containers back to the customer rather than having to continuously produce new containers uh, for yep. their product shipment. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. That's um really good insights there to kind of get a sense of, of, of what people are seeing as challenges and kind of how this is all fitting together. Now, let me ask kind of as we wrap up, what, where do you see the, um, the industry going kind of over the next number of months to a couple of years on the sustainability side? Like what, what do you see technology wise that's maybe coming down the pipe or most you're most excited about that's really going to start to enable more adoption um, on this side of things? Uh, on the one hand, I see a big push on the sustainability side uh, in the sense that uh, like uh, carbon equivalence uh, emissions need to be reduced okay. on all aspects of companies. Okay. So they will also look at using uh, IoT to reduce uh, their their waste and their emissions. Uh, and I think that it will be really beneficial for 
ourselves, but also other companies to focus on that as a leading discussion point with customers. Um, sure. On the innovation side, I see a lot happening happening in the uh, machine learning on the device side. Okay. So we can do much more uh, with that little bit of energy and that little bit of processing power we have on an embedded device, making them smarter and making them uh, by, for example, updating the firmware remotely on a device and adding more tricks into it for, for getting more data out of it, uh, we can enable many more use cases. Um, so each individual IoT device will only become more valuable over time. Yeah. Um, and then maybe lastly, where I see a really big rise at the moment is in mm. uh, the whole space of satellite IoT communication. So sure. Sure. everywhere where there is currently no coverage, uh, yep. there is there's going to be cheap, so affordable and reliable coverage as well. Yeah, the satellite space is super fascinating for sure. We've uh, been speaking with companies uh, about the na nano satellites and what they're doing and, and how they're playing a role in this and also how they're seeing this enable potential solutions and wider adoption because of that more robust coverage. So, um, so totally agree with you there. Um, last thing I want to ask you is for the listeners and the watchers um, out there that are listening to this, watching this episode, what's the best way for them to follow up with any questions if they want to learn more about SODAC and kind of all the different things you have going on? Uh, what's the best way to do that and best way to reach out? So the best thing to do is to uh, contact us directly. So uh, you can contact me on, on LinkedIn, for example. Um, you can reach out to our uh, support team. Uh, we have a forum as well, uh, which can all be found through our website. Um, we are going to be at many of the events in the near future, uh, such okay. as the, the CES, uh, Mobile World Great. Congress. And uh, I think more in the, the immediate uh, term, we uh, have a really cool project running uh, about uh, air quality monitoring uh, where you can find more information on Kickstarter as well. Fantastic. Um, well, that'd be a lot. That's very exciting. And uh, in addition to that Kickstarter kind of information, is there anything else coming out on, from a news standpoint or, or announcement standpoint that we should be on the lookout for? So uh, in the coming year, uh, we are going to be doing more and more with the smart label technology. So cool. okay. embedding technology into paper thin solutions, that's uh, awesome. and and that's going to be our big shift uh, for uh, for 2022. That's very cool. I've I've heard about that. Company's trying it, but um, very excited to actually see it work. Uh, and I think you guys have some very exciting and interesting things going on. So very excited to kind of keep keep an eye here uh, for everything going on at Sodak. So so Ali, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it for being here. Thank you as well, Ryan. Uh, and uh, it was uh, nice to have this chat. Absolutely. All right, everyone, thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.